Hey guys, Laura Whitmore here, owner of Strategic Test Prep. I've been a test prep coach for over 15 years now. I super score a 1570 on the SAT. And I'm here today to tell you guys what I think are going to be on your May test. So just a heads up, if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button below because I come out with videos every week to help you master this test. All right, guys, I've noticed there's so much overlap on the digital SAT and the paper SAT right now because I'm working with international students on the digital SAT, as well as students in the U.S. on the paper test. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of concepts that are still the same. So in this video, I actually chose concepts that I think are relevant to both tests and that I'm pretty confident are going to show up on your test. Now, make sure you watch my other predictions videos from August on up because all of those predictions videos are still relevant right now since they're all from this school year. And I really, really think if you watch all my predictions videos from the beginning of the school year, you could get a perfect score on the math. Speaking of scores, why don't you go ahead and comment below? I would love to hear what your goal is for the May SAT. What do you want to get on the English? What do you want to get on the math? Where are you scoring right now in your practices? Just, you know, let me know where you're at. And of course, this video is brought to you by Preply, the fun new digital SAT prep app where you can actually prep on the go from your mobile device. And guys, listen, the test is a couple weeks away. So if you are a digital SAT student and you've run out of questions on Blue Book and you've run out of questions on Khan Academy, Preply has over five full tests worth of questions right now with more being added in regularly. So go ahead and download the app in the App Store or in Google Play today so you can keep prepping with questions that are just like those on the digital SAT. And if you're a paper-based student, like if you live in the U.S. and you want to up your math score, I would definitely recommend you use Preply as well because there's so much overlap. So the first concept I want to go over with you guys are basically solving difficult absolute value expression problems because the SAT is starting to throw in a twist. So let me show you an example. So what you want to do on these is you want to move everything away from the absolute value expression. Treat the absolute value expression like it's a variable. So I'm going to get the 7 over to the other side. And then I have this. And now I have to divide out the negative 3. So I have this. So those are your curveballs. They'll throw a constant onto the end. They might throw a coefficient in front. Just get those away from the absolute value. Now the answer to this one would be no solution because... You can't have an absolute value expression equal a negative. So that would be like a third curveball that they would throw in. Just a heads up for you guys, like just for review purposes, if you had it equal to a positive number, you're going to have two solutions. Drop off the absolute values, set it equal to a positive 4 and a negative 4, and then solve. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is a lead into a sentence. You guys, if you have a lead into a sentence, what I mean by that is it's they're starting to introduce what they're about to talk about, and then they put a comma right after it. That's like an introduction comma. What comes right after that has to be the subject or what they're talking about. So in this example, it says, while not as convenient as online forums... Well, whatever it is that's not as convenient as online forums is the subject, and that's got to come next. So it is not what's convenient. That's not the subject. We're going to cross off B. Relevance can't be convenient, so we're going to cross off D. And advice columns relevance is not what is convenient. We're not comparing that to online forums, so we've got to cross off A. The only subject that makes sense is the advice columns themselves, so we're going to pick C. Expect something like that on your test. I've been seeing that coming up a lot. All right, graphical representations of a function. These are huge, and they've been throwing in a lot of exponential functions where you have to find the y-intercept, right? Now, this one was on the last test in March, and they threw a little twist in. It's not an exponential function. When you look at this equation, you're not going to know exactly what the graph is. That would be kind of crazy. But what you can do is use the y-intercept as your north star still because a y-intercept means x is zero. And so when you look at a, b, c, and d, also too, I would play a little majority rules. Notice how b is the only one that's um, right of the origin and the other ones are all left of the origin. I would probably get rid of b right away just for the simple fact that it's such an oddball. But then you want to look at, you know, where the y-intercepts are at. Now, look at D is at 10. These ones, like um, C, well, C is at, I don't know, maybe 2. 
And then A, it looks like it's going to be a really big number or yeah, it's not an asymptote because it does cross on the other side, but it's going to be a really big number. So if we can just figure out what the y-intercept is of that um, function, we're good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put zero in for x and see what I get. Okay, so the y-intercept should be at eight. So the one that looks like it's close or at about eight is D. All right, if you're liking this video so far and you're finding it helpful, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Let's get to the next question. All right, punctuation, it's gonna be on your test. It's good to have the punctuation rules down. And they're they're throwing in little twists lately. So just as a reminder and just as a quick review for you guys, um, a, a colon, you have to have a complete sentence on the first side, anything on the second side. Semicolon, you need a complete sentence on both sides. Pick the hyphen if there's another hyphen in the sentence. And a comma cannot separate two complete sentences. So just there's some little caveats in there. Like, for example, just to give you a little exception, semicolons can also separate items in a list, which I saw them do last year on the May test. So there's a chance, because now we're in the May test again, that you could see semicolons separating items in a list as well. So just be mindful of that. But here's the twist on this problem. We have a complete sentence. It says, Gay went on to impart a lesson learned from experience. Okay, so we could have the colon or the semicolon work. But the thing is, you want to know the difference between a colon and a semicolon and how they function. A colon is used to then explain more about the statement that was just made. Now, notice that the second part, keep writing for youth is not a prerequisite for artistic success, is explaining more about the lesson that he imparted from experience. So we're better off picking D than B. Okay, the next one is interpreting a function, especially an exponential function. I think that these are becoming more prevalent now because the digital SAT students can use a calculator on the whole thing. So now they're testing your knowledge conceptually of understanding the components of a function versus just solving one because when you can graph it in your calculator, it's a lot easier. So what I want you guys to be mindful of is the language if you get to an exponential function question because there's a difference between if it doubles every 664 years versus each year for 664 years. So if you see them say it doubles every 664 years, that means it happens one time every 664 years. So you have to take the number of years and divide it by 664 because you get one iteration every 664 years. So if you see the word every divide, if you see each year for the next 60, 664 years, well, then you're basically just going to have an exponent of X because it happens every year. So don't divide by anything. The exponent will just be the number of years that goes by. Okay, determining median of a data set. The SAT throws these in to try to confuse students. And you have to be really careful because what you don't want to do when you get to a question like this is just go right to the middle value. We can't say, oh, the median value of a data set is five because it's in the middle of three and seven. You know, every single bit of information they give you on this test, you're going to use. So you've got to be wondering, well, why are they giving me this other column, right? Frequency columns are important because it tells you how many times each value is counting. So there are nine total values based on the frequencies. Three is counting one time, four is counting zero times, five is counting two times. So if there's nine values and we line them all up, the middle value is going to be the fifth value. So when you're looking for the median of data set one, you're looking for the fifth value. Well, we only have one value here and then we add zero values. We're still at one. And then we add two values. Well, now we have three values that's still not to the fifth. Oh, but once we get to this frequency, we hit the fifth number. So that means the median is really at six. Okay. So the same thing with data set two, you've got nine values total. You want the fifth value. So go down the frequency column until you get to the fifth. Two plus three is five. So your median value on that one will be at four. All right. Subject verb agreement is huge. This is a standard English convention question, which means it comes up on the paper test and on the digital SAT. This was a really tricky one, so I like this example. Um, now, what you can do, I just wanted to show you a trick. So if you're trying to figure out what verb tends to pick, you can actually take a pronoun, for instance, the pronoun they, it's a plural pronoun, and test all of your answer choices. I can say they dwell. I, can, I can't say they dwells. 
I can say they are dwelling and I can say they have dwelled. So notice three of the four answer choices are verb tenses for a plural um, subject. Only one is singular. So it's going to be the one that's different. The singular one will be the answer. And when you go and test that out, we're talking about the purple sea urchin doing the dwelling and that's singular. So it would be the purple sea urchin dwells. All right. They are starting to throw on confusing percents problems. It showed up on the March. I think it's going to show up on the May. It's showing up on the digital SAT too. In another video, I showed you guys how to use a strategy called nice numbers on this. But I also think that there's another way to handle all of these percent problems. All it comes down to is setting up the equation correctly. So when I have a math phrase like P percent of X is 13, I can write that as an equation. Now, percent, you guys, means out of 100. So when I want to write P percent, I'm going to write it like this. It's P per 100. Now, of means multiply. So I'm going to multiply it by X. So P percent of X is is equals. So equals 13. Now, rule of thumb, when you have a negative symbol or a variable next to the fraction, put it up in the numerator. So let me just rewrite it to make it easier. I'm going to put that X up with the P. And then what I'm going to do is I'll cross multiply. So I have PX equals 1300. Now I'm solving for X because it says which expression represents X. So I want X all by itself. I'm going to divide by P. So here's my answer. Which one gets me that? Well, 100 times 13 gets me the 1300 that I need on top. And then I'm done. All right, guys, that's it for this predictions video. Thank you so much for watching. I am on pins and needles. I can't wait to hear how the May SAT went for you all. And yeah, I'll see you guys again soon. Happy prepping.